have your Bibles and would like to go ahead and join me in the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 4 is where we'll focus our attention this morning. So glad that you're here. Thankful that you've chosen to join your friends and family if they invited you. Thankful for those who extended an invitation. And I know that you will come to know our family here at Chisholm Hills as a great family. I know it's family. And I know it's family for a couple of reasons. There are a lot of reasons. Wow, wake up. Wake up. We ought to be used to that by now, the folks that, that uh, attend here regularly. The switch from the pulpit mic to the lapel, it always uh, wakes everybody up. But I, I'm going to tell you how I know that Chisholm Hills is family. And I, and I think there's at least one person in every family that will relate to what I'm about to say. So you know how uh, there's always one person in the family that, that everybody else picks on. It could be the middle child. That's how it is in my family. We always pick on Jacob, my middle brother. But usually there's uh, just someone that the family picks on. And, and then, not just is there someone that the family picks on, but everything that person wears is called into question. They always comment on that person's outfit. Well, I've never ever been that person. We still pick on Jacob and my family for the things that he wears. But this morning, I walk out of the bedroom, and I had a tie on. And you know that I don't normally wear a tie on Sunday mornings, but I had one on this morning, and I heard from my mom and from my wife this morning, you're wearing a tie. And I was like, man, okay, that's my family. Well, then I walk in Chisholm Hills in the building, and I, man, I've had 15 people say, you're wearing a tie this morning? And it's family, man. That's just what family does. They they, they rivet each other. They joke with each other. They get along with each other. They make jokes and have fun. But this family is also there in the hard times and the difficult times. And I've seen that so many times over this group here at Chisholm Hills. And I'm thankful you're here. Colossians is a book about relationships. It's a book about relationships that are threefold. The first is your relationship with Jesus. You noticed in that reading that Brand, Brandon read for us in Colossians 3 and verse number 4, Paul says, When Christ who is your life. Really, the book of Colossians, it, it, it exalts the supremacy of Jesus. The fact that he shouldn't just be a prominent figure in the way that you live, but he should be preeminent, that he should be everything. He should be the one on which the foundation of your life is constructed, not just a brick in the wall, per se. The second fold or the second idea of relationships is your relationships with other people. Not just other people, but other people in the world, right? And Paul talks a lot about our influence and our relationship and how we live out our calling in Jesus. If you read on in chapter 3, he talks a lot about the contrast between the new and the old man and, and how those people that have belonged to Christ, they are noticeably and distinguishably different than everyone else in the world. And the way that we relate to those people in the world is now transformed because we're Christians. And then the idea number three, or at least relationship number three, that's massive in the book of Colossians is the way that you relate to your church family. The way that you relate to other people who are Christians. The way that you relate to people that have given their lives to Jesus just like you. And it's that that I want to focus on this morning. And the other things are going to be included. But I really want to draw into this idea of friends and family. Because that's why you're here. At least some of you are here. Because you were invited by your friends or your family. They count you to be friends or family. And hopefully you count them to be the same. That's usually the question that old folks ask. You know, when you say, this is my brother, and then they turn to your brother and say, you claim him as your brother? We do that with Dale Hayes and Ben all the time, right? We ask Ben, you claim Dale as your brother? Right? You know what I'm talking about. Maybe, maybe this morning we have trouble uh, with our friends and our family. Maybe we have trouble with earthly relationships. I can pick on Dale. for the, Dale picks on me, so I can pick on him. He's an easy target. But you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there, there was one guy that said, to dwell with saints above, oh, that will be glory. But to dwell with saints below, that's a different story. We know how relationships work sometimes. Huh? It's hard to get along with folks. We need encouragement in our relationships and how to build those stronger. And whether you're a friend or a family or you belong to this family here at Chisholm Hills, uh, I think Paul has some encouragement in the book of Colossians for us. If you have your Bibles, look with me at Colossians 4, beginning in verse number 7. Colossians 4 and verse number 7. Now what you're tempted to do is think as you read verses 7 through 18 through the end of the book, what you're going to see is it's just a big list of names. And Paul does this often where he recalls 
or brings to memory to these churches the people that have assisted him in his work, the people that have made carrying on the gospel a little bit easier. And he does the same here in verses 7 through 18, but I think there's something really important that might help us this morning to strengthen not just our relationship with our church family and not just our relationship with people we encounter in the world and not just to strengthen our relationship with Jesus, but perhaps all three. Let's read together verse number 7. Paul says, Tychicus, our dearly loved brother, faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. I've sent him to you for this reason so that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, a faithful and dearly loved brother who is one of you. They will tell you about everything here. Aristarchus, verse 10, my fellow prisoner sends you greetings, as does Mark, Barnabas's cousin, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And so does Jesus, who is called Justice. These alone of the circumcised are my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, verse 12, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. He is always wrestling for you in his prayers so that you can stand mature and fully assured in everything God wills. For I testify about him that he works hard for you, for those in Laodicea and those in Heropolis. Luke, verse 14, the dearly loved physician and Demas, they send you greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her home. After this letter has been read at your gathering, have it read also to the church at Laodicea and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea and tell Archippus, verse 17, to pay attention to the ministry that you've received in the Lord so that you can accomplish it. I, Paul, am writing this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Before we dive into those relationships, what I'd like to do first this morning is make a couple of observa observations from those verses that we read, verses 7 through 18, about these relationships that Paul had. And, and, and this isn't just limited to Colossians. Paul does it in Romans, too, where he lists all of these fellow workers. He does it in First and Second Timothy when he's passing on this charge to preach the gospel to Timothy. He tells about all these people that helped him along the way. The first thing you need to know about this text before we move on any further is that Paul didn't do Christianity alone that he couldn't have done Christianity alone, that nothing Paul accomplished was done without the help of somebody else. I mentioned those chapters to you. Romans chapter 12 is one of, uh, Romans 16, I'm sorry. And he mentions 26 different people in Romans 16, 26 different people that helped him to take the gospel to someone else, whether they helped someone individually or they helped churches collectively, or maybe they just went across the land spreading the gospel like wildfire, but either way, it couldn't have been done if it wasn't for other people, right? Right here in Colossians chapter 4, you have 10 different people that Paul mentions that helped him to do Christianity. That's really important this morning. You need other people to do Christianity. You can't do Christianity alone. You can't. You can't do it apart from a church family. You just can't. You can't do it from other people. Like apart from other people, that will build you up and make you strong. You just can't do it. Here's observation number two. Christians have always done it that way. It wasn't just Paul. But Christians always needed each other. It didn't start. Paul wasn't the guru of relationships that just exploded the church families. It wasn't him. They've always done it that way. Christians had always, need, followers of God had always needed each other. And they relied on networks to expand the borders of their kingdom. They relied on each other to expand the borders of their kingdom and their ministries. It's always been done that way. Number three, relationships are just part of discipleship. That is, you continue to grow in your faith and your relationships, they mature and they grow. And they are expanded to meet different people in different places and different backgrounds. That as you grow in Jesus Christ, so does your relationships. I, I think uh, Proverbs 27 and verse 17, we say sometimes as arn as arn. Man, I really, really sound like I've been living in Alabama for a few years, huh? As iron sharpens iron. So does one friend sharpen the county. Y'all are never going to forgive me for that one. Arn. Arn. Yeah. So, uh, so one friend sharpens the countenance of another, right? We, we know the importance of friends. And as we grow in our relationship with Jesus, so then does our relationships grow with other people. At least they should. Number four, relationships are developed through shared experiences. How many of you have a close relationship with someone because they have gone through something you have? 
and that your relationship has continued to grow together because they have experienced things that you have or vice versa. Now you're helping them through things that you've experienced and, and so together you grow because you have shared experiences. And you'll see that in this list as we break down some of these names, that was true for Paul. Here's number five. It's beneficial to have relationships that are different than you. You, you know that list in Colossians 4 and verse number 10, those people that we read? There are some people that are givers, and then there are some people that are goers. They just go all the time. There are some people that were good friends. There were some people that weren't good friends. There were some people that were really faithful to Jesus, and then there's another person in that text that completely left Jesus altogether. Paul had relationships with all kinds of people. He had relationships with all kinds of people, and I think those set the tone then for some great lessons for you and I this morning as far as our relationships are concerned. Let's quickly notice a couple of things or people or groups of people perhaps that Paul had relationships with right here in Colossians 4 that I would argue that if we're doing this Christianity thing right with our relationships, we ought to have relationships like these two. Here's number one. Paul had relationships with the faithful. I would argue that there are five faithful friends, good, loyal friends in Colossians chapter 4. And they're scattered throughout. They're not all in order. But as Paul recounts or remembers all of these people that helped him along the way, there are five people that stand out to me as really loyal friends. And sometimes you pick up on that because of the words that Paul uses to describe them. Other times you have to sort of dig into a little bit of secular history about these people to understand their role in Paul's life. But I think that you'll see as we read through some of these great friends. Notice the first one right there in verse number 7. Paul mentions Tychicus. And he says about him in verse 7 that he was a dearly loved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. And he will tell you all the news about me. I've sent him to you for that very reason, so that you would know what's happening in our lives. Basically, Tychicus was Paul's personal FedEx delivery guy. And, and, and not just do you see it in Colossians, because he says, I'm telling you, church at Colossae, I sent Tychicus, Tychicus to tell you this message. He says the same thing in Ephesus to the church at, at Ephesus. I sent Tychicus to you to tell you this thing. Over in the book of Philemon, he tells Philemon, I sent Tychicus to you to tell you this. Tychicus just did the work of Paul. Not just the work of Paul, maybe on a grand scheme as you broaden the scope. Tychicus did the work of Jesus because he was faithful to Paul because he was a loyal friend of Paul, because he didn't turn his back on Paul, because anything that Paul needed, that guy was there to help him. He was there to, to do anything to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Colossae, even to Philemon when there was this discussion about the slave Onesimus, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes anyway. But you see then how Tychicus was truly living up to his name or description of a faithful minister and a dearly beloved fellow servant in the bonds of Jesus Christ. I think there's no higher commendation of any other person listed in this section of verses than what Tychicus receives about Paul or from Paul about his character. There's nothing ever negative that I could find stated about Tychicus in all the scripture that he was a faithful, loyal friend to Paul. Here's faithful friend number two, and it's in verse number 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings, is what Paul says. Now, not much listed about him, and so I was like, well, I need to find out a little bit more about this guy, and I came across something really interesting to me about Aristarchus. Not just is he a fellow servant of Paul, but he was with Paul on some of those missionary journeys when there was a riot in Ephesus. You remember reading in the book of Acts? Aristarchus was there. When Paul was sailing and he, he came across the shipwreck as he was sailing across the sea, Aristarchus was there. So he was there in some difficult moments in that ride in Ephesus, and he was with Paul during shipwreck. And now it seems like, according to Colossians 4 and verse 10, that Aristarchus might have been in prison with Paul. Now the question is, and so many commentators and scholars have tried to figure this out, is whether or not Aristarchus was there by choice or if he was there because he had done something wrong. Now some people suggest that maybe Aristarchus was there because of the same reasons as Paul, that they were just doing what Christianity demanded and they were preaching Jesus and some people didn't like that and it landed them in prison. That happened to a lot of people, not just Paul. So it could be the case that Aristarchus was there for the same reason that Paul was, because he was a loyal, faithful friend, and he was helping him spread the gospel, and so he landed himself in prison. But there was another perspective that I had never considered before, never even knew about. Apparently there was a Roman law 
there was a Roman law that allowed anyone who was in Roman prison, who was uh, imprisoned by Roman soldiers, they could have one personal attendant to serve with them their entire sentence while they were in prison. I didn't know this. And so maybe it is the case, if that is the case that Aristarchus chose to be there, it only further validates the loyalty and the faithfulness that Aristarchus had in his heart toward not just Paul, but the cause of Jesus Christ. He was a loyal, faithful friend. Here's friend number three, faithful friend number three. It's right there in verse number 11. He says, and so does Jesus who is called Justice. You know, Jesus was a popular name among Jewish families. In the Hebrew, it was Joshua. It means God is salvation, basically, is what it means. But maybe Justice took on another name. That's what history seems to suggest, that when he moved into Rome, he was uh, one of the first Jewish converts, at least that's what history suggests. And when he moved into Rome, instead of keeping his Jewish name, Jesus, he changed his name to Justice because everyone was so, uh, well, they, they regarded Jesus as such a special and high name, and rightfully so, that he didn't even want to, to take away from the value of that name. So he changes his name to Justice so that there would be no confusion. Not that there would be. He would never be who Jesus Christ was. But he did that because he didn't want to be confused with Jesus Christ. But here you have this commendation of him in verse number 11 as a co-worker in the kingdom of God for Jesus Christ. He was a faithful friend. Here's number four in verse number 14. Luke, the dearly loved physician. And that's all that's mentioned about him here. But you know that Luke was special to Paul. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse number 10, when Paul was nearing the end of his life and he's telling Timothy that he's about to die, he says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, only Luke is here with me. Only Luke. You know that Luke was a special friend of Paul, and maybe I can think that Luke was the one that attended to all of Paul's wounds and stripes that he had acquired along the way preaching for Jesus. Luke was a great physician. He was a great physician. He was very skilled. He was very precise and exact about the things that he did, and you know that because of the way that he wrote in the book of Luke, the gospel, and the book of Acts. He was a very precise and exact friend, but he was loyal. And he was faithful. Even up to the end of Paul's life, he was the only one that remained. Here's faithful friend number five. And finally, look at verse number 15. You see this person that's mentioned, Nympha. Now, some of your Bibles might say something different, right? If you're reading the King James Version, you're going to see something like this. Nympha and the church in his home. If you're reading pretty much anything else that's more modern, the ESV, the NIV, the CSV, maybe even something like the New King James, you're going to see Nympha and the church in her home. That's not a problem. It's not a contradiction. There's a couple of ways you can explain that and go through it. And so maybe I was reading and you heard Nympha and her home, and your Bible says Nympha and his. There's a couple of things. Some of the earlier manuscripts, the Latin Vulgate, they say his. It's a masculine Greek word. And so maybe people think, or you might draw from that since it's a masculine Greek word that it must be describing a man. But there are occasions where sometimes they would give the man's name to represent the household. And it could be that this woman, Nympha, was the leading Christian in her home. How many of you are raised by good Christian women whose fathers weren't raised in the church? Or maybe they weren't active in the church. Or maybe you think of Lydia in Acts chapter 16, who was a great warrior for the Lord and did all kinds of things. She was a leader and, and, how, and, and uh, hosted a house church, is what I was trying to say. She was a great leader in the church, right? Maybe Nympha was the same person. But regardless of whether or not it's his or her, whether or it's a guy or a girl, it doesn't matter. Paul lifts them up and exalts them as this person who is a faithful friend, who is doing great things uh, playing a critical role in the advancement of the kingdom of God. Now, here's my question. This is what I'd like to do as we move through some of these friends. I want to ask you a couple of questions that maybe drive it home. As we consider five faithful friends, here are my two questions for you. Number one, do you have faithful friends? Do you have loyal, faithful friends? People that stick close to you no matter what. And then the follow-up is this. Are you a faithful friend? Are you loyal? Are you faith? Will you stick... Stick with them no matter what. Will you turn, not turn your back on them when it gets hard? Will you be there with them through thick and thin, right? Are you a loyal friend? Here's group number two that Paul encounters in, in Colossians chapter 4, at least that he describes. There were some fervent friends. 
there were some fervent friends in the text, particularly there was one, and I want you to notice him in verse number 12. He mentions a guy named Epaphras, and he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, which is he was from Colossae, sends you greetings. He is always wrestling for you in his prayers so that you can stand mature and fully assured in everything God wills. So basically what Paul says about this guy Epaphras is he's a prayer warrior. That man prays all the time for you. He prays intense, passionate, intentional prayers about you. That he remembers you every time he prays. And he prays passionately for you. He is moved to take your name before the throne of God. Because he loves you and cares about you so much. And he's called a servant of Christ right there in the text. And that word's more than just a servant, it's a slave. Which means he realizes that all of his possessions and all of his aspirations and every bit of his existence, it's in debt to God. He owes it to God and he recognizes that. And in order to fulfill that role, he says, I'm going to talk to him all the time. I'm going to give everything I have to talking to God. That phrase in the CSB in verse number 12 says he's wrestling with you in prayer. It was constant. It was frequent, and it's, in, it's intense. That's what the phrase indicates in the Greek, that he was very passionate about his prayer. In fact, the Greek word that's translated for wrestling in your Bibles, it's also translated as agonizing, the same Greek word that describes the emotions of Jesus in the garden when he prayed to his father about there being another way so that he could avoid the cross. It's a strong, it's an intense word. And that's the way that he describes this guy, Epaphras, that he was fervent in prayer. He was constant in prayer and he was intense in his prayer. Notice what he's praying for. He's praying for the Colossians to not give in to some of these false ideas or these false notions, but that they would be confident in Jesus Christ, that they would be confident in the assurance or the hope that they have through Jesus Christ. He wanted them to stand firm. Now, of 10 people mentioned in Colossians 4, there's only one guy that's praised for his prayer life, and it's Epaphras. Now, that doesn't suggest that all the other people didn't pray, but it just means that this guy viewed prayer as his ministry, that he says, I may not can do much, but I can pray. I can pray for folks. And if praying is the only thing you can do, what a good thing to be able to do. Here's my question for you as we consider this group of people. Do you pray for your friends? Do you pray for your friends? I mean, are you constant in prayer for your friends? Are you intense in prayer for your friends? Do you intentionally pray for your friends? If not, you should. Here's relationship number three or group number three. You encounter the indecisive in the text. Paul was friends with indecisive people. Now, that's hard for me. I don't know about you. It's hard to be friends with indecisive people. But Paul was. Look with me at verse number 17. He mentions a guy named Archippus. And you listen to the admonition that Paul gives to Archippus. The admonition means to put in mind or to be intentional about reminding of the duties or obligations that you have. And that's exactly what Paul does in verse 17. Listen to it. He says, pay attention to the ministry that you have received in the Lord so that you can accomplish it. Now, there's more to Archippus than what you just read in verse number 17 of Colossians chapter 4. The other insight that you get is in the book of Philemon. There's only one chapter. It's verse number two. Philemon introduces us, or Paul introduces us to Archippus in the book of Philemon in verse number two. And you can conclude by that verse that Archippus belonged to the family of Philemon. He was a Colossian. Some people suggest that maybe he was like the backup preacher to Epaphras for the church at Colossae. He was an important role in the church. But apparently at some point or another in his desire to follow Jesus, he became indecisive. Obviously, Paul is encouraging him or admonishing him to fulfill his role, to step up and finish your work. Don't, don't play church. Don't just balance between the two. Fulfill your work. Pay attention to your ministry. Give everything that you have to it. And so somewhere along the lines in Archippus' life and his faith, there was a little bit of wishy-washy. Maybe he was sliding spiritually. Maybe the work of the church got too much for him. Maybe there were too many people criticizing him. Something happened in Archippus' faith, as it does in our own, where we get tired sometimes. And it's hard to be all in on Jesus Christ. It's hard to fulfill or complete our work in Jesus Christ and to do our best because we just get spiritually tired and we slide a little bit. Or sometimes we just simply lose our focus. That happens to all of us. And Archippus was that guy. He needed a nudge. He needed a little nudge to think about, hey, Archippus, come on, get back to work, man. 
decide to follow Jesus. Fulfill your ministry. How many of us have needed that nudge? Are you thankful for the people that gave it to you? You may not have been in that moment. It might have hurt a little bit. It might have meant that you had to accept the reality of your situation and you need to make some changes. But I guarantee you that every person that's sitting here right now is thankful for the person who gave them a nudge, who helped them decide a little bit. Let me ask you a question. Are you that friend? Can you think of somebody that needs a little nudge? that's struggling in their faith, that's spiritually tired, that loses their focus? Can you be the friend that nudges them a little bit and helps them out of the rut that they're in and gets them back on the course? Paul was that guy. Jesus was that guy. Let's be those people, right? Here's group number four that Paul encounters in Colossians chapter four. He, he encounters the unfaithful. Paul was friends with unfaithful people. And, you know, we say all the time, well, you don't need to be friends with the world. And that's true. James is right. You don't. To be friends with the world is to be enemies with God. And that's not what we want. But we'll never be able to convert anybody. We'll never be able to change anybody. We'll never, ever let people see the goodness of Jesus if we don't have relationships with people who aren't faithful to him. And I want to point out one person in the text. And I know that you're going to know who he is when I read his name. But he's in verse number 14. There's not much mentioned about him. Luke is the dearly loved physician, and right after that it says, Demas sends his greetings. It's kind of like this friend I had when I was growing up. I, I, I think I went on more dates when I was in high school with this friend and the girl than I did with just a girl alone. Like, he was my best friend, and he went everywhere with us, everywhere with me. And still to this day is one of my greatest friends. But he was also kind of annoying sometimes. You know you can say that about your best friend, right? That, that sometimes your best friend can be a little bit annoying when you spend a lot of time with him. And he was this guy that, say I was on the phone with a girl, and he would be in the background constantly saying, hey, tell her I said hey, tell her I said hey, tell her I said hey. And finally, just to appease him and make him shut his mouth, I would say, and Logan says hey, you know, like that. Just, just so, and she didn't care to hear from him, and I didn't care to tell her, but I just had to say it so he would be quiet. And I think that's kind of how Demas is treated in Colossians 4. There's not much said about him, and there's some other things about other people that are included, but Demas just gets, oh, by the way, Demas sends his greetings, and that's kind of how it's pictured. And there's, there's some inconsistencies in Demas' faith, and they're not included in, in Colossians 4, but you find them out later in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10. I said that about Luke earlier. That was 2 Timothy 4 and verse 11. This one's 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10 where it says of Demas that he has deserted us. He has forsaken us, having loved the present world. And that was just a few years after Paul wrote the book to, Colossian, to the Colossians. Maybe Paul could sense something in Demas' faith. Maybe Paul could read the signs on the wall. Maybe he could see the actions or the lack of actions. Maybe Paul could see the faith or the lack of faith that Demas had. Maybe he could see that he was starting to to backslide a little bit. Maybe he could see that Demas had a relationship with the world and he wasn't really faithful to Jesus Christ. Paul could see all of that, and so can we, right? Nobody that's living one foot in and one foot out is, everybody can see it. We fool ourselves into thinking they can't, but everybody does. And maybe Paul could see it about Demas. So Paul includes him in this list, and I think it's noble of Paul, but I want you to know that Paul had a relationship with this guy. And there's a couple of other places that he's mentioned. He's mentioned uh, in, in the book of uh, 2 Timothy that I mentioned, and that's the unfaithful version. But Paul often throws him into this list of people that he had a relationship with, and I think there's something there. I don't know what happened in Demas's life. It was a weakness. It was a slip-up. There was something that happened that caused him to become unfaithful to the Lord. But I think it's really important that Paul had a relationship with him. Now, here's a couple of questions I have for you. Has that happened to you? Have you slipped like Demas? Are you unfaithful to the Lord? Is there something that's causing you to sort of drift or slide away from Jesus Christ? And let it not be said of you that you deserted him, having loved the present world. We don't want that to be your case this morning if it is you. But then the question that I would like to ask you about your friends is, do you have relationships with people like that? That if anybody who has deserted the Lord, would they feel comfortable talking to you if they wanted to come back? Do they know that you care about them if they wanted to come back? Do they know that you wouldn't judge them if they did tell you that they had sins in their lives, but that you would point them to a Jesus who would forgive them and bless their life and change their life? Are you that friend? We should be. Here's group number five that Paul encountered. Finally, this morning, he encountered the forgiven. He had relationships with forgiven folks. There's two friends that fall into this category in the text. They are Mark and Onesimus. 
The first one, Onesimus, that we'll talk about, you remember him from the book of Philemon. He was a slave. He was a slave that ran away from Philemon and met Paul in Rome, and he was eventually baptized and saved. And then Paul sent him back to Philemon because he said, look, you need to make this right. You're a Christian now. You're a dearly loved brother is what he mentions in the book of Philemon. And he sends him back with that very commendation to Philemon and says, I want you to receive this guy. I know he ran away from you. I know he did what he shouldn't have done. But he's a Christian now. He's a brother in Christ, Philemon. And you accept him. Jesus forgave him. Forgive him. Good gracious words are hard. Jesus forgave him. Paul forgave him, and he wrote the book of Philemon in hopes that Philemon would forgive him too. And I think he did. But here you have this guy, Onesimus, that had done his fair share of wrong, and he had come back to the Lord, and Paul was friends with that guy. He liked to be surrounded by people that were forgiven. Then you think about Mark. This is Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, who went with him on those missionary journeys, and he's also the guy that people believe wrote the book of Mark. They're the same person. Mark and John Mark are the same, uh, same person. So here you have this guy who obviously had a relationship with Jesus because he wrote about all the things that he saw him do. He was an eyewitness to everything Jesus did. That's the gospel of Mark. He went with Paul and Barnabas and others on these missionary journeys, telling of everything that he saw Jesus do. But you remember there was that one occasion in Acts 15 where John Mark, he wanted to go along again. And for whatever reason, on the first missionary journey, John Mark had left and went back home. And that left a bad taste in Paul's mouth. And it just really rubbed him the wrong way because they had work to do. And he needed John Mark. And John Mark went home. But in Acts 15, Barnabas is vying for John Mark. He's standing up for him, just like Barnabas had done for Paul in Acts 9. And he's asking Paul, why won't you forgive him? And eventually, it didn't happen in Acts 15, but eventually it did. Eventually it did. You learn later in life when you consider John Mark and what happens. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when he was telling Timothy about the people that were there with him, he mentions Luke was with him. He says, Demas has forsaken me, but he mentions this about Mark in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 11. Get Mark and bring him to me because he is useful to me in my ministry. He is helpful to me in my ministry. So somewhere in between Acts 15 and 2 Timothy chapter 4, John, Mark, and Paul, had they had mended fences. Paul had forgiven John Mark, and they had a relationship together. Here's my question for you. Are you a forgiving friend? Do you hold grudges over people that hurt you? Do you hold grudges over people that have caused problems in your life or hurt your family? Forgive those people. Be a forgiving friend. Mend fences. Be a forgiving friend. Here's my encouragement to you this morning. As we consider those five groups of people that Paul had a relationship with, Paul, Paul was an expert at relationships. He was good at them. He was good at building bridges with people that had never experienced Jesus in their life. He had a testimony that was unlike most. He was saying, I was the worst of the worst. He tells Timothy, I was the chief of all sinners. He had a testimony that was powerful. But he could say and use that testimony, use the experience of his transformed life with Jesus and help other people see Jesus. He then could take the people that were faithful at once and weren't anymore and have a relationship with them. He could take the people that give their lives to Jesus and be friends with them. Paul could literally be friends with anyone. Do you know why? Because he let Jesus rule in his heart. Christ was his life, Colossians 3 and verse number 4. Everything Paul did and everything Paul said was governed by the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And it's possible for you this morning to have relationships with all kinds of people, with people who are loyal, with people who are fervent. And I hope that these describe us. But you can be friends with the indecisive. You can be friends with the unfaithful. You can even be friends with the forgiven. And we hope that the indecisive and the unfaithful, they come back and you're friends with them because they're forgiven. And as a result of your friendship, they are forgiven. You can be friends with any of those people. Paul was, but it wasn't because Paul was so great. It was because he modeled his life after Jesus, who did the very same thing, who was friends with all kinds of people, that changed the lives of all kinds of people, that had relationships with all kinds of people. Are you that friend? Are you a friend of Jesus? Are you a friend of Paul? Are you a friend of others? That's a good way to measure our lives. Maybe you're not a Christian this morning. You never obeyed the gospel of Jesus. You can be a friend of Jesus this morning if you'll obey the gospel. You can be added into his family what a great family if you'll obey. Maybe you are a Christian and somewhere along the lines you've lost sight of 
maybe some of your relationships, maybe you're not a forgiving friend. Maybe, maybe you hold it over their heads. Or maybe, maybe for those people that are struggling with one foot in or one foot out, you have no tact and you're rude and you're mean. You're not compassionate or understanding or merciful like Jesus would have been. Don't get me wrong. He put his foot down. He stood on the truth, but he did it in the right way. Maybe we could work on that too. Maybe we can continue to build our relationships by being a loyal and a fervent friend. We all have things we can fix this morning in our relationships. But the goal, the goal here is to build as many relationships as we can with as many people for the glory of Jesus Christ so that as many people can experience what we know to be true about being in the presence of God for eternity. We want that for you this morning if it's not your reality. You can respond uh, as we stand.